Today on Stick to Football, just a solo show today, our guy Connor out with a little bit of food poisoning. Uh, we don't know what happened on South Beach last night, but uh, thoughts and prayers to Connor. Something uh, at the Heat game, I guess, got him a little sick. He hopefully will be back uh, on Thursday uh, when we have a ton of interviews lined up. But today it's going to be me running through a lot of the draft news and going to be joined by Penn State pass rusher Yitor Gross Mato. Somebody really excited to talk to, a guy who's overcome a ton to get to this point where now he's one of the premier draft prospects in the country. Want to remind everybody, though, this Saturday, February 1st, we actually have a really busy day here at Stick to Football. At 1 p.m., we're going to be hosting an event with special guest Kenny Vaccaro, safety for the Tennessee Titans, a, a Texas guy. So, you know, Melo and I are going to be really excited to talk to Kenny. We get to talk to him about how do you tackle Derrick Henry? How, what does Ryan Tannehill mean to this team? A lot of, you know, Mike Vrabel stories. It's going to be a good time, and it's actually open to the public. So, you can check that out. It's at 1 1 one one so double 11 lincoln road here in miami beach florida it's definitely gonna be a good time and then that evening hopefully you've seen us posting about this we're actually going to be co-hosting an event in downtown fort lauderdale they're taking over 25 bars three city blocks closed to traffic chiefs fans are basically invading fort lauderdale so myself mellow uh, Connor will be there. A lot of special guests. Dante Hall, Tamba Hali. It's going to be a good time. Uh, it's free to the public. There were some VIP passes that sold out, but it's free. So you come down. They're going to have merch for sale, Boulevard beer to drink, all those great things. So it's like an extension of the tailgate tour, basically. And I'm gonna, I'm just going to be talking to the, the video guys here today because I don't have anyone else to talk to. So George, Maddie, hope you're ready. We're going to have some conversations, guys. Uh, get a microphone ready. Let's start things off right here, though. The Cleveland Browns, uh, maybe this is, shouldn't be a surprise to us, but – we woke up, the Cleveland Browns are once again firing people. Alonzo Highsmith, who's been in the NFL forever, played college football at the University of Miami, has been everywhere. Highly respected guy who came up with the Green Bay Packers. There was talk that at one point he would be a GM. Well, he goes to Cleveland with John Dorsey a couple of years ago and becomes a, a high-level scout there. Alonzo Highsmith fired this morning by the Cleveland Browns once Andrew Barry came in as the new general manager. And there's speculation that Elliot Wolf could also be fired. Now, these are two like, blue blood names when it comes to scouting in the NFL. Elliot Wolf's dad, Ron Wolf, is one of the, if you're going to make a Mount Rushmore of scouts, you probably are putting Ron Wolf on there. A guy who really built the Green Bay Packers in the Brett Favre era, literally wrote the book on team building. It's called The Packer Way. Definitely recommend picking that up. My copy is so like dog-eared and, and marked up with notes that I actually need to get a new one. So with Ron Wolf's son, Elliot, now out, and with Alonzo Highsmith out, the Browns are kind of put in this situation where they don't have any true what I would call traditional scouts in the front office. And I tweeted this uh, Wednesday morning, and a lot of people got really upset at me because they said, well, Andrew Barry, the GM, is a scout. And I want to clarify here on the podcast, well, we have some time to do that, why I say he's not a traditional scout. And I actually reached out to a couple of people who've worked with Andrew Barry this morning just to make sure that my memory was correct about this. So Andrew Barry broke in in 2009 as a scouting assistant with the Colts. Now, scouting assistant does not mean you're a scout. It means you're doing a lot of cutting up tape. You're probably doing a lot of number crunching. You might even be doing things like organizing schedules. You know, we were talking to a, a scout yesterday that said on the phone, and he said the same thing. You know, a lot of these guys break in. They're booking hotel rooms and flights. I'm not saying that's all Andrew Barry did, but most people break in in that. Then he became a pro scout for the Colts. So if you're a pro scout, you're evaluating current NFL players. You're looking at free agents. You're looking at guys you can sign on the waiver wire. So you're not grinding it out. You're not going to Alabama scouting the offensive line. You're not going to LSU scouting Joe Burrow. You are looking at guys who've already made it, which no disrespect, it's a tough job and it's a good job, but it is not road scouting for the draft. It's very different. From then, he was promoted to a pro scouting coordinator. So pro scouting coordinator, for you guys who haven't been behind the scenes, that's somebody who is going to be running a lot of the nuts and bolts, the organizational side of things. Again, not on the road evaluating players. And I'm going to keep hammering that point home. The Andrew Barry, and I hope he does a great job in Cleveland, Lord knows they need the help. But he has not been somebody that is out on the road evaluating. A lot of this time was spent coordinating and in the analytics side of things, which is very important to Cleveland. Then he services in Cleveland in 2016, 2018, VP of player personnel. Again, not out on the road scouting, but working more on the analytics side of things. Goes to Philly for a year this past year. <coughs> excuse me, same title, VP football ops, a lot of analytics, a lot of coordination, and now the general manager of the Cleveland Browns. And I think there are some things to applaud here. Andrew Barry's 32 years old. He's the youngest general manager in football. Hey, good job to you, man. That's four years old, younger than me, and you're a GM in the NFL. That that deserves some some applause. He's done a great job to get to this point. And then another thing that's very important now, he's only the second African-American general manager in the NFL, something that we all know has been a problem with minority hires. So hey, kudos to Andrew Barry. Like I said, I hope he turns it around. But when I say things like they don't have a traditional scout in the top end of the decision-making process, they don't. Paul DePodesta, I mean, we all know he's a baseball guy. 
Andrew Barry, I mean, he played college football, but he's more of an analytics guy. So if Elliot Wolf is let go with Alonzo Heisman now out, the Browns don't have someone who is that guy that you want to send. They don't have an Ed Dodge. You guys have heard us talk about him before. Or Trent Kirchner, Scott Fitterer, somebody that you're going to send out on the road to do a lot of the heavy scouting. They don't have that guy, and they're going to need to find him as they fill out this front office. Again, once again, the Browns are hitting the reset button, so I don't think anybody should be surprised about that. Now, in Houston, we've been waiting for, it uh, seems like a year now, for them to hire a general manager. There's a lot of talk that it might be Nick Casario once his contract came up with the New England Patriots. That did not happen. Nick Casario, uh, they tried to get him last summer. Turns out there's a clause in his contract that he couldn't leave. So the Houston Texans roll through the 2019 season without a general manager. They pull off trades for Laramie Tunsil. They get Kenny Stills. They ship Jatavian Clowney out. And now they've just made it official that Bill O'Brien is going to be the general manager as well as head coach. So if you want to talk about control in an organization, guys, it is Bill O'Brien. He is the head coach. He's the general manager. They fired their cap guy, so he's the cap guy now. I mean, this is unchecked power that Bill O'Brien has in the Texans front office. That's a lot of trust for the ownership group to put into him. And I think for O'Brien, you can say, okay, well, we, he might not be the most likable guy in the world, but he's won a lot of ball games with the Houston Texans. His ability to develop Deshaun Watson probably saved his job. But this does feel like a little bit of a make or break because if it doesn't work, it all comes down on Bill O'Brien. He's the only guy in the NFL who actually has the title of general manager and head coach. And we haven't seen that in a long time where somebody actually has it. Now, you could say that like, Bill, pa that Bill pa Belichick excuse me, is the general manager, but he has, doesn't own that title. You could say that Andy Reid has a lot of personnel control. He doesn't have the title. Pete Carroll, same deal. Bill O'Brien, the only guy who has a GM title along with head coach, which is it's kind of amazing that he's the one who is going to break that mold. You know, it, it kind of used to be this way. Jimmy Johnson, Bill Parcells, you know, they wanted to buy the groceries and cook the meal, as Bill Parcells famously said. But it really switched to where we didn't have guys doing both jobs. And we'll see if it works with Bill O'Brien. If so, there might be more people who are more owners who are looking at this type of setup of you have a guy who's been there now six years. He's had some success. So maybe you just want him running the whole operation. All right, we're going to take our first break. We come back. I'm going to run you guys through some of the draft rumors that I'm hearing, some players rising up my big board as we get into draft season just a couple days away after Super Bowl 54. You know, we're going pedal to the metal on the draft, and then we'll have Penn State's Yeter Gross Matos coming back right after this. All right, we are back, and once again, a solo show today. Mello is off educating the youth of America. Connor is hopefully in bed drinking lots of Gatorade and getting some rest, so I'm chilling with the video guys here uh, on Radio Row in South Beach. So if you're watching on YouTube, Yes, it's awkward that I'm sitting here staring into a camera by myself. I feel like the fucking president giving a fireside chat right now. Or I'm waiting for someone to like come up behind me and not realize I'm working and just start talking to me. Uh, that has happened before. So we'll, if it does, we'll just roll with it. We'll see what happens. But I wanted to run through some of the things that we're hearing out in the draft community. This is kind of a dead period because everything gets so focused on what has happened in the NFL with these two teams. We're, we're talking about the Chiefs, the Niners, all week long it feels like. And, you know, the passing of Kobe Bryant ha has affected a lot of this, too, because a lot of the, the focus, as it should, in the sports media world has shifted to Kobe. A and, and again, as it should. So next week, probably going to heat up. Uh, teams that aren't in the Super Bowl right now, most of them are going to be in scouting meetings. They're going to get the whole crew together after the Senior Bowl, and they're going to run through the tape. They're going to watch the game tape. They're going to watch the practice tape. They're going to run through their interview notes, and they're going to start to really, truly stack the board when it comes to the 2020 NFL Draft. Now, you guys know what that means. When they start stacking the board, those scouts get bored. They start talking to guys like me. So there's going to be a lot of information coming out within the next few weeks. But some things that I feel like are notable, and, and one of those is the rise of Mekhi Becton. And it has been, we talked about it on the show yesterday. Daniel Jeremiah, great friend of the show, uh, put Becton at number four overall and kind of just rocked the draft world. Now, there had already been some talk about well, he would be a first-round pick. You were, you were starting to hear that heat up. Starting to see it in some mock drafts that Beckton would be a first-round pick. Now it just seems like a foregone conclusion that he's going to be a top 11 pick in the upcoming draft. Now I mentioned it on Twitter, mentioned it on previous shows. I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to get caught up on game film. I, I was actually just talking to Jeff Schwartz, who spent a long time in the NFL, a good friend of ours, and about the fact that because of tailgate tour this year, kind of behind the eight ball, and you find these moments where you get a two- or three-day break to catch up on film. Christmas break was one of those for me because, you know, we're, we're not out on the road working. Uh, this past week in between Senior Bowl and Super Bowl, I had two days where I could just sit and, and watch tape and get caught up on players and talk to people. You know, talk to scouts, talk to trainers. And having that opportunity, Becton was the one guy I really zeroed in on because he was not really on my radar as an underclassman. 
uh, coming into this year. So he wasn't somebody that you're super evaluating like Jedrick Wills or like Andrew Thomas. So it was a little bit of a surprise. So there is a rise, but it's not because of anything he did. The rise of Becton is more because no one was watching him and paying attention to him as a draft prospect, at least in the media side of things, until kind of late in the process. Once he declared, once that January 20 deadline goes by for guys to go back to school, you get a chance to watch and say, okay, this guy's he's pretty special. To be as big as he is at, at 6'3", I'm anxious, excuse me, at 6'7", I'm anxious to see what he actually weighs in at. Uh, he's listed at 370. I think he'll probably be down from that when the actual combine rolls around. But I'll tell you, my comparison for him was Bryant McKinney. And my notes are he's huge but moves like a smaller guy, a basketball player with balance and body control, great hand accuracy, and he's very, very strong at the point of attack. Something we've been talking about on the show for years is that the NFL is getting smaller on defense because you want speed. You look at Kansas City, look at San Francisco. You need speed to keep up with those guys. Now offenses are coming back and, and countering that with size and power, and Beckton is perfect for that. So don't be surprised if, like DJ put it, I don't know that he's going to be the number four pick, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's a top 11 pick. And I say 11 because that's where the New York Jets are, and that's where we expect the run on tackles to kind of end. Now, another thing that I've been hearing a lot over the past uh, couple weeks, really, is that we should expect five quarterbacks to be drafted in the top 15. Now, you might listen to that and say, that sounds like a smokescreen from a team drafting outside the top 15, that they want quarterbacks to go early because it will push more good players down to them. And I'm not disagreeing with that, especially here we are in almost early February. There's a lot of smoke out there, and a lot of teams are still trying to figure this draft class out. So I think with this noise, it could just be that. But when you look at the draft order, the Bengals are going to take a quarterback at one. The Dolphins are probably taking one at five. The Chargers at six. The Panthers could at seven. The Raiders technically could at 12. The Colts at 13. The Buccaneers at 14. There are a lot of teams that need quarterbacks. And while we can look at this class and say, all right, it's Joe Burrow as a franchise quarterback, and then there's a gap because there's questions about Tua's health. There's questions about Justin Herbert's touch and his ability to get through reads. There's questions about... Jordan loves turnovers and level of competition. Questions about Jacob Eason with limited film and the fact that he couldn't beat out a guy like Jake Fromm. So there, there are a lot of questions out there. But when you look at the class and the, the amount of needs, I don't think it should be a surprise for anyone. And we'll see. Free agency is going to have a huge impact on this. Where does Tom Brady go? Where does Phil Rivers go? What happens with Cam Newton? What does Drew Brees decide to do? So there's going to be a lot of dominoes that have to fall for five quarterbacks going to go in the top 15. But it is absolutely possible that we see that run on quarterbacks. Now, two players who are moving up the board for me, and I, I hate to use that expression because it's it's just that you're getting to see them more and you're more properly rating them. It's not like they have done anything to necessarily rise this time of year. But one is Kyle Duggar, the safety from Lenore Ryan, who we got a chance to watch at the Senior Bowl last week. And he was someone who I actually waited to watch a lot of game tape on because I didn't want my first impression of him to be basically at D3 level football. I wanted to see him against Power 5 teams. And when you watched him, you know, the few games I did watch of him at Lenore Ryan, I mean, he looked like a guy that might have to move to linebacker. He was just so much bigger, stronger, and faster than a lot of the players that he was seeing. But then we get him down to Mobile, and he played, lo- he played safety all week. Also returned punts. I mean, he really showed off his athleticism. I had questions about his ability to really sink his hips and open up and run. He did that all week long in Mobile, though. So I think when you look at Kyle Duggar, he's made the case to be a mid-second round pick. You could probably put him in there. I think Xavier McKinney's kind of on an island by himself. Then you have Grant Delpit, Ashton Davis, who was hurt and didn't get to go at the Senior Bowl. And then I would put Kyle Duggar in there. Now, he's going to be somewhat scheme-specific because he is almost like a strong safety. You know, he's almost like a throwback-type safety who could walk up and play some linebacker. But he truly did look like a special player in Mobile. And because it's mock draft season, I have a seven-hour mock draft coming up Monday morning. When you start to do a mock draft, it's funny because you have all these players that you really like. And you think, this guy's a a top 30 player. This guy's a top 50 player. And you start to do the mock draft, and you realize that some guys go much earlier than you expected, and some guys go much later. Well, the one player who I always find is in the top 35 picks is Cesar Ruiz from Michigan. And I'm not afraid to say it. He's my top-rated interior offensive lineman in this class at this point. I think he's a damn good center, uh, very agile. He's tough in space. He's good at the point of attack. So all season we talked about Creed Humphrey. Well, he goes back to Oklahoma. Tyler Biedish really struggled this past year. Nick Harris is a pretty small guy coming out of Washington. So when you watch the Michigan tape, Ruiz is just absolutely dominating people in the Big Ten in a pretty good football conference. So if you're a team like my team, the 49ers, who might be looking for a center because of Weston Rickberg's injury, you know, the Chiefs could be looking at center. A lot of teams late first round could be looking to fix a hole in their interior offensive line. 
for me, Ruiz is the top guy in this class. All right, fellas, we'll take one more break. We come back. We have two more breaks. Excuse me, I can't count today. Two more breaks. We come back. We've got Yeter Grossmatos, Penn State pass rusher, joining us here live at Radio Row in Miami Beach. Uh, we promised you guys awesome interviews all week long, and I, I'm just going to be honest. I've been saying your name wrong all year, I bet. So will you just nah, I get it, put I get it on it. the record for me? Yitor Gross Matos. Okay, I think I've been saying Matos. Yeah, Matos. either everyone says that or they say, like, Etor. They just think Forget the, the silent. Yeah, I can see that. We need to give you a good nickname, like yeah. a good, strong nickname. Just make it easy. <laughs> and right before we started rolling, we were talking about you as a draft prospect, since that's my job at BR yeah. to evaluate guys. And you wanted to know where I had you ranked. I said, I'm a big fan because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, link size, not a lot of guys like you. H have you watched anyone like Brian Burns from last year and thought, like, oh, okay, I'm kind of like that guy. And he went 15 overall. Or yeah. is there anyone that you kind of try to model your game after? Um, from last year? Or any years, you know. Right, it's Khalil Mack, that's fine. You know, you can say anybody. <laughs> I really like Bradley Chubb, like, like the way he was built and, like, how he uses his athleticism. Uh, so I was a really big fan of his since – Probably my freshman year I got into college. I think that was. So if I had to compare myself to anyone, that would probably be it. I mean, that's pretty good. He was he had a pretty good rookie year. Yeah. So that's a good pick. What is it like being at Penn State where you're up against such great competition every day? Now, I've talked to guys at, at like, you know, Alabama, LSU, where they're like, you know, the drop-off or the from the NFL to Bama is like not that difference. At Penn State, I mean, you've seen guys like Saquon Barkley, Miles yeah. Sanders, some really good players. Guys what do you different. think? That, I mean, yeah, like if you've tackled those guys in practice – you're probably going to be okay in the NFL. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, those guys, like, they're just certain players I feel like it's just not something you see every day. So, being like, going on to the next stage, and I feel like everybody's going to be like that guy. So, you know, it's a good way to put awesome. it. It's like there's going to be 11 Saquons on the other <laughs> side of the field. <laughs> Who's the toughest tackle you've gone against? The Big Ten's toughest known tackle. for running the ball. I'd probably say the tackle from Michigan. Uh, I Runyon. His name, 75. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And dad, his dad played. I don't know if you're old enough to remember his dad. Nah, was in the NFL I actually didn't know his dad yeah. was in the NFL. So I said that. I told someone that the other day, and they're like, "Yeah, like his dad was a beast." His dad was. His dad was pretty great. But yeah. I mean, yeah, Michigan, Ohio State. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've gone against some of the best, best Iowa. Said some good guys. Yeah. Um, if I remember right, was it last year? You guys did you play Iowa in 2018? I played them all three years. Yeah, and. That you might be the reason their left tackle is going back to college because <laughs> he was like, no, I'm not ready. I'm staying in college instead of going to the draft. I mean, you had a field day against two players that headed into this year, people were talking about they might both be first-rounders. Yeah. And you had a pretty good day two years in a row. Yeah. Uh, I mean, those guys were phenomenal, but, you know, I just sometimes. You can be honest. You don't have to be <laughs> humble. You can be completely honest. Uh, I just, I mean, sometimes when they're better than matchup, uh, some days it's just not your day. But, I mean, look, like, those guys got a lot of respect for me. Like, they was really good really good players on that side of the ball. Yeah. You can, I see you being humble. Like, man, I don't want to get in trouble. It's only, <laughs> it's only my first day on Radio <laughs> Row. I'm not trying to start shit. We actually got Cody Ford and Charles Aminahue to, like, beef on Twitter last year with these interviews. So, really? you might be our guy. We might get you uh, and Alaric Jackson going uh, at it this year <laughs> instead. Uh, but what type of DN do you think you are? For, for our listeners and viewers who haven't had a chance to watch you play a lot, how would you classify yourself? I mean, are you an outside the tackle guy? Are you versatile? What type of player do you think you are? I think I'm very versatile. You know, you could use me pretty much anywhere along the front. Um, I think, you know, I'm someone who plays, like, real physical. Uh, I like to get, like, not a lot of space. So, I mean, I think as far as, like, rushing-wise, you could put me in, like, any position on the front line, and I could uh, find a way to be effective. Yeah, and you're still young, right? I mean, yes, you're, still, you're still fun. How old are you? I'm 21. Yeah, so you're a baby still. you got a lot of <laughs> room left to grow, man. Yeah. So is that something that as you've been training for the draft, are you paying attention to, you know, that balance between how much you weigh and how strong you are, but also wanting to be quick and fast for the combine? Absolutely. You know, I've been putting on uh, – I put on about 10 pounds so far. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going to go into the combine at, but I'm um, still feeling fast, still feel like I can move pretty well, so I'm not – not really worried about my weight at the moment. What types of things are you doing in training? Is it a lot more like three cone prep, or are you doing more position specific stuff, working on pass rush moves? Uh, it's really a combination. Like I feel like it's really 50-50 uh, in terms of like combination of like the working on like how to run and uh, that type of stuff versus the position uh, the position work. Yeah. Now I have to ask you because I think everyone asks you about this. You obviously have a really unique story yeah. of. You know, losing your brother. Mm -hmm. uh, I have three brothers. I can't even imagine. Uh, and then also losing your father when you were really young. How much of that, I mean, do you still carry with you on a day-to-day -day basis where, I mean, you picked your number after after your brother, right, 55? Yeah. 
So how much of that is with you every day? And what will that moment be like when you hear your name called, you know, that, that they're not here with you, but that they're going to be a big part of that moment? Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like for me personally, like they're part of everything I do, you know, and like every decision I make, uh, I know that they are like watching over me and I just try to like carry myself in a way that I make them proud uh, with everything I do. And, and I feel like when I go out there that night and I do hear my name called, I feel like they will be with me like in spirit. So I feel good. And one question that every team's going to ask you, yeah. uh, I'm sure you're ready for this, is, you know, what do your parents do? What was your upbringing like? And you're, you check those boxes just fine, right? I mean, both parents. You know, high character people, you've never yeah. been in any kind of trouble. And your parents are both police officers, is that right? They were police officers, not anymore. But that's how they met. Yeah, they yeah. met in the forest. Yeah, I've, I did my research, man. I checked <laughs> it out. I checked it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I've read a couple articles about you. So, no, I mean, th but that is a big part of it. So, yeah. uh, I think, uh, you know, your agent will have you ready for this. But being able to say, like, no, I come from a good family. You don't have to worry about that. It's just another selling point for you as a player. Yeah, no, I come from a great family. You know, uh, my dad still works. Uh, my mom actually just started teaching, and my, my older sister is actually the gym teacher at my old high school. So, I mean, everyone's doing real well for themselves. And yeah, and then there's you. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be <laughs> playing in the NFL real soon. Uh, you mentioned the draft. What are, you, what are your plans? I mean, are you gonna if you get invited to Vegas, are you going to go do the thing? Are you going to hang out with family? What what's your what's your idea of what draft night will be for you? I mean, if I got invited to Vegas, I'm going to Vegas. Have you seen the stage? It's on water. Yeah, so I didn't know if that was real. It's real. That's real. Yeah, I'm yeah, nervous about dope. that. I'm not. I, no, you're I good. Like, <laughs> yeah. Man, I don't know. They'll have you on like a jet ski or something going up to the stage. It would be cool. That would be sick. But if if you get that opportunity, you're it, that's something you've thought about. Like you got to be there. Absolutely. Why is that? For I, I mean, I topped out in high school. You could probably tell by looking at the difference between me and you. But what is it about that moment of being on that stage as opposed to hanging out with your family at home, is, yeah. it, is it just, like, the spectacle of it all? I mean, I guess so. Like, you grow up watching that and it's like, like that's kind of something, like, like I want to be like those guys. That's that's the position I want to be in. So, now you got the opportunity to do it. I mean, I jump all over it. Yeah. And you get to hug Roger Goodell. Yeah. Which is, which is <laughs> just pretty cool. Uh, this Super Bowl, obviously, uh, is a lot about the pass rushers. You know, there's mm -hmm. Nick Bosa, there's Frank Clark. When you look at those, the way those guys are built and the way these teams are built, is that something that you feel? Because you're going to get asked at the combine, you know, what, how do how do you fit into our scheme? Do you feel like you're like those guys and that you can do a little bit of everything? Uh, yeah, I feel like we're we're different, in, you know, in some ways, obviously. But uh, and in terms of like versatility, I feel like I'm similar, you know, in the things that I can do on the field, um, whether it's in space or on the line. So, yeah. yeah. Now Chase Young. Um, obviously came back to play against you guys this year after his uh, little little time off. Yeah. You've been on the other side of the field from him, but when you look at Chase Young, who everybody's in love with in this mm -hmm. year's class, what differences do you see between your game and his? Um, I mean, he's a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, football player. Um, and he just gets a lot of a lot of opportunities, you know, gets a field. I mean, he just makes stuff happen. I mean, um, that dude's just a playmaker. Yeah, how do you um, go at someone like that or like yourself? Like if you were on, the, if you were playing offense for a day, yeah, you're like okay, we gotta we gotta go at Chase Young or you gotta go at yourself or uh, Chase on at LSU. How do you go at a guy like that? I mean, I can talk from personal experience. Uh, like, there's no time that he should not have been double teamed. <laughs> like, <laughs> that just didn't make it, it didn't make sense. Yeah. Like, he should have been double teamed at all times. Yeah, and you see Nick Bosa in the NFL right now, basically doing the same thing yeah. uh, that he did at Ohio State. So. Uh, how excited are you, man, for just the, the next – this week's going to be fun, but then after that you jump right back into the grind because the combine is like three weeks from now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, I've had a lot of fun since I've been out here, but I've been really focused at the same time, um, really taking advantage. Uh, I feel like I'm improved. Um, I feel like I'm ready and I'm going to blow it up. Are you, you doing everything at the combine? Uh, for right As of right now, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like it when guys are just confident – I want to go in and be competitive. Yeah. Uh, I do have to ask you, though, uh, who are you picking in the Super Bowl, Chiefs or Niners? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now you know how I feel every day. <laughs> I feel like I feel like I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go with the uh, the Forty ers That's not what I, I expected everybody to pick the Chiefs because really? Mahomes and MVP. Uh, but I like play it. defense, right? I'm a Niners fan, so I'm glad to hear it. There we go. All right, man. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy South Beach, and uh, we'll see you at the combine, dude. All right, thank you. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate it, man. It. All right, guys, that is our show for today. Thanks again to Yeter Gross Matos for coming by the show. Uh, definitely looking forward to seeing him throughout this draft process. And uh, thanks again for 
setting us up here at uh, Radio Row to our amazing video and audio people. We will be back uh, tomorrow, Friday morning. We'll have a show for you. And then Saturday afternoon, don't forget, sitting down with Kenny Vaccaro. That episode will come out Monday. So a lot of good sticks of football coming to you over the next couple of days. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. For Connor and the crew, we'll talk to you all real soon.